Uh, John Adams, the guy that did Nixon in China, and he's composed a number of operas. He did uh, Oppenheimer. And I was so stunned that he'd done this piece called The Transmigration of Souls. I went up and introduced myself, and I told him I taught philosophy, and that did he know about the myth of Ur? No, he didn't. And I went, oh, man. You know, it's the text for your composition. And uh, anyhow, so, but he's got another piece that actually I think is more uh, appropriate. So, I did, so uh, the myth of her would be a great performance piece. And I think I told you I wanted to do it on New Year's Eve 1999. Uh, just to go into the new millennium. And it, you know, it was, lent itself to that beautifully, but I, I didn't get to organize it. I'm curious if you, do you mean like, uh, like, yeah. sort of the context of the myth of her too, or, do you, or could it be a different context but, but apply the same concepts? Like, I mean, what I'm, what I'm trying to ask is like modernize. Could you put the myth of her in modern times? You could, sure. I don't know how you do that. I mean, I, yeah. I like the, the whole staging uh, details as Socrates describes it. <laughs> so, but you could, you could vary that in any way you wanted to, just like they do Shakespeare in modern dress and so on. <clears throat> but it, it just, it, I wanted to do it before I left Cambridge. I was teaching at MIT at the time. And I knew the guy that ran the Carpenter Center for the perform, uh, Performing Arts at Harvard, which is the only building that Le Corbusier did in this country. And it had these two great ramps. And it lent itself perfectly. And so I actually proposed it, and we were going to do it. And I had an artist friend that was collaborating with me, Gerd Stern. And uh, we, were, we didn't have enough time. It was, I, I should have proposed it the year before, but I didn't think of it. Did you do part of it? I mean, no, we didn't do any of it. And my thesis advisor was Eric Erickson, who was the major theoretician of human identity. And he was going to be the unnamed prophet who came out to address everybody. So, I mean, it would have just, that would have made it. I mean, it, and he was so dramatic looking really remarkable looking guy but it wasn't to be so you guys can still fulfill my dream of seeing it perform and there was a woman here that taught myth and it was a huge class and I tried to get her to invite me to come and do the myth of her but she didn't do it and I always thought and she performed some stuff as part of the class exercise so I thought she should be the one to put it on but, but I I never got to know her very well. <clears throat> okay, everybody, let's come to order. So is everybody is all everybody clear? Alex, is, are everyone on the same page? Did, did uh, Faye give you any instructions about what she had in mind? She didn't talk to me after you guys' meeting. So whatever you guys talked about after. We didn't talk about anything. You did, she didn't, uh, that's a bummer. She said she was going to bring it up with you. Because her idea was uh, everyone that turns in a log gets a B, and if you want an A, you turn in a paper. So I heard. But she said she was going to run that by you. But she didn't. Hmm. That's rather unfortunate. So, well, anybody well, can do that. Yeah, it's... exactly. Does that seem okay? Yeah. Like a five, do we want to say like four Just to five formulate page? your own theme. Does a four to five page paper sound reasonable? Because yes. The finals we Anything did? sounds reasonable to me as long as I don't have to bother with it. And, um, <laughs> and do you think uh, the way, do you think we could turn it into you Wednesday, drop either? No, I turn it into you. Email, okay. And you guys all could email me. And if you have a physical, Wednesday. Um, yeah, Wednesday or Thursday, what would you guys prefer? <laughs> Thursday. So can, Thursday? can you guys do that? Mm -hmm. Can you tell me what you would have in mind as a theme? What? I kind of I want to talk about uh, how testosterone affects brain development and how that brain development may have actually led to certain areas of the brain going into the metacognition. You know, no, think. no, no, no. No. I want to talk about Mars. It doesn't sound Greek to me. I mean, the Greeks may have had, you know, humongous hooches, but I don't think it had much to do with their brains. Of course. You know, and, and my point would be Achilles had an enormous thymus gland. So that's different from what you have in mind. There's no testosterone in the thymus gland. So what, I mean, are you still stoned, Alex? No. Oh, okay. <laughs>
you can still root these things in the philosophy. What does it have to do with, with, uh, with the, what we did? I in will the do a whole new paper topic. We need not dwell on this one. <laughs> okay. Move to something so if somebody else proposed something that's apropos, and it isn't so off the wall, because it. Yeah. Now, the Ate thing is, to me, central. And that's one of my special interests. Because I teased it out. You know, the myth of Ate and the Iliad isn't that big a deal. It's just what Agamemnon says to Achilles when they make up. But I got struck by that. You know, this figure, the eldest daughter of Zeus, who is the figure of delusion. And my theme for most of my life has been an interest in delusion. It was one of the first, I would call it an insight, it was kind of like a revelatory moment when I was a sophomore or junior at St. Olaf College in Northfield, Minnesota, and I'm walking out of the old main building and I get this kind of epiphany about, oh, delusion, what a central concept. And I had no idea where it came from or what it meant, but that was a moment. You know, the year would have been about 1951, 52. So then I find Ate, and she is the goddess of delusion. You can't quite say self-delusion, because the issue is there's not really a self, which is maybe why she is so powerful. Uh, you're at the mercy of the play of forces that the gods represent, and so when she deludes Zeus, he throws her out of Olympus. Now she walks over the heads of men and women and leads all astray. And I mentioned to you that she lands on the site of the future Troy, which as a mythical symbol knocked me out. I mean, I thought, well, that's what myth is about. That's so fabulous to think of that. Because I had already spent a lot of time thinking about Ate without knowing that feature from legends about her. And this confession of Ate on the part of Agamemnon goes to, Achille, to Socrates. So if you have a clear notion of what Ate represents in the myth that Agamemnon tells about her, and, that, and sometimes it's translated as ruin. So she is the fig, I call her the imp and impulse. That, that's a brilliant thing to say, which I made up. Imp and impulse, you know, and I got it from having grandchildren. Well, also from having a daughter. Well, and then reflecting on my own teenage years. You know, you're, you're at the mercy of impulses that can, you know, knock you off. You know, driving a car 100 miles an hour on a, on a city street. What's more nuts than that? And it's simply a, a crazy impulsive act. Reckless. So she's the one that engenders that. She is the imp in the word impulse. And I thought that's just fabulous to really encounter this figure and then to take it to Socrates who makes the confession of self-delusion. You know, as if to say once you become rationally self-conscious as he is, you can take your impulses upon yourself and confess them and therefore be free of them. You can overcome them by acknowledging them and confessing them. It's not unlike the confession of sins in the Christian tradition, the word for which is repentance. So Socrates makes this the Greek version of repentance, which means you can make yourself transparent. Uh, you have nothing to hide. You can confess, and this makes you transparent. And this is what attracted Plato to Socrates, that he had nothing to hide. And one of the great moments in the Republic, which is pertinent to describe right now, is called the uh, Ring of Gyges. I think I might have mentioned that to you before. It's in the third book of the Republic. And Glaucon and Adamantus, who are the brothers of Plato, are discussing the issue of justice with Socrates. And he's sticking to the notion that it is, it is be better to uh, suffer um, f for not being unjust than to commit unjust acts. And so they put it to him. They say, okay, here's the shepherd that's looking around in a cave and he finds this ring 
shepherd's name is Guy Jeez. And when he puts the ring on it, it makes him invisible. So what's he do? He goes immediately to the kingdom. He kills the king and has intercourse with the queen. And their point is, wouldn't anybody do that? If you had the power to do it? And go undetected? Wouldn't you do anything you wanted to do as long as you were, could do it undetected? As long as you were invisible? And it was, it was one day when I thought, oh, I get it. There's a huge difference between being invisible and transparent. And Plato sees that Socrates is transparent in his moral behavior, whereas so many people are, would, would actually be immoral and do unjust acts if they could get away with it. That is to say, invisibility. And for them, invisibility is great, way greater than transparency. And Socrates was transparent to Plato. And that's indicated by Plato by referring to Socrates' masks. It's a great theme in Plato which Nietzsche picks up on. He had an ugly countenance which masked his inner beauty. And he talks about the Silenus, that were these little figures that stood at doorways. I mean crossroads, maybe in doorways too, but anyhow, crossroads. And, and Socrates looked like a Silenus. And they, if you broke them, they had uh, beautiful images inside them. So uh, they were kind of guardians of, of crossroads, which is a big Greek theme. There's a theme about Achilles, uh, Hercules at the crossroad, where he may, you have to make a moral decision, you know, which way to go. And so these figures stood there as a kind of indication of the moral implications of going one way or another. And Socrates was likened to them because he looked like them. But inside he had this inner beauty that Plato saw, namely, he was transparent to the good, the true, and the beautiful. You could see it if you could see through Socrates' mask. And that was a help to me also in trying to uh, understand the so-called notion of, or so-called doctrine of Plato's ideas. You know, they're always referred to as being in the kind of heavenly realm of ideas. And I thought, no, 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 they were incarnate in Socrates. He is the existential embodiment of the great ideas, the forms, the true, the good, and the beautiful. He incarnated them in a human person just as he incarnated philosophy so that his being is the being of philosophy. You can go right from the being of Penelope as we described it in the great Homeric simile to the being of Socrates. And that's what Plato receives and he's so transformed by it, you get the dialogues as a consequence. So that was a riff. I uh, thought it would be interesting to write about um, the fear of non-being and how Achilles and Socrates... That's another one, rest. yeah. So in a way, Achilles is a proto-philosopher because of his coping with the revelation that's unique to him that he's going to die at Troy. And so that comes into fulfillment with Socrates, who says that philosophy is meditating on having to die and having one foot in the grave, which is exactly the meaning of consciousness in Homer, your last gasp at the point of death is the only time consciousness is referred to, psyche, in the Iliad and the Odyssey. Oh, isn't that amazing? And then Socrates makes this last gasp, the point of reflecting on throughout your life. Yeah. Uh, you draw a Hercule, Hercules in a story coming to a crossroads. Yeah. I've heard Hercules was kind of like a, the Greeks would tell stories about the amazing things he could do but also how he was a little bit of a nutcase. I don't know about that, but he, they, they were the major labors that he had to undergo. So that's a fantastic myth of the... I was, like, cause I was thinking of writing about him, he didn't he go mad one time and kill his wife and son and 
No, I can't remember. We'd yes. have to look it up. Yeah, I that. yes, you know? That's why he had to do the 12 labors. Is that why he had to do it? Yes. Yeah. Some God made him mad at that. Yeah. So just to say, like, how he was great, but in body, not in mind. Really. I think it was Hera that did that. You know? Hercules at the Scheidewege. I mean, it's a great <laughs> German theme. They make a lot of it in German. Just Hercules at the crossroads. And uh, so, come on now, don't forget that it's self-delusion and not ignorance. That's a big letdown. And I think it's because of translating the Greek word for delusion, which is agnoia. You know, nous means reason. So agnoia means, you know, the opposite of reason or the clouding of reason or delusion. And when that gets translated into Latin, I think it went to ignorance, whatever the Latin word is, ignorantia. And so you lose the force of what it means to confess your self-delusion by calling it ignorance, which means you could just as well have been informed, but you weren't, as opposed to you thought you knew when you didn't. And that's a big uh, complaint of mine, that the whole tradition went down and dumb because of the difference between delusion and ignorance. You lose the whole force of what Socrates was about. And what it is, it's a methodological principle that you apply to your rationality. You always have this check that just because you think you know, you may not. And that's a difficult thing to do because when you think you know, you think you know. So how in that moment can you check yourself? And I've really, I've bitterly regretted the experiences I've had when I should have checked myself, like investing in something. How could you be so dumb as to throw in your money after that? Well, because I was deluded. I mean, I, it's the only way I can explain it. I thought the guy was a friend of mine and it looked like a good plan. And so I, you know, I just missed all the warning signs because I didn't do the check. And then Socrates has this internal figure, his daemon, that always helps him with the check. So you could say, the figure of Ate goes to the Socratic daemon, who instead of being an imp and impulse, always tells him what not to do. So it's a reversal of impulsiveness. It's a, it's a kind of figure of conscience or a guardian angel that protects him from doing wayward and impulsive acts. So that's another way to uh, chart the course of what we've come to from Homer to Socrates. That's a very good one. And it's what makes him such an exemplary figure, that he's overcome what most people are burdened by. And then, you know, how fantastic that his counterpart, aside from Plato, should be Alcibiades, who is one of the most impulsive, reckless figures in Athenian society at the time. And Socrates, in a way, shows him the light. He gets a glimpse of it, and he rejects it and turns away from it to his own self-destruction and, and to the injury of the Athenian state because he betrays it and becomes a traitor and goes over to the enemy. So I was liking him to Judas, to Jesus. And uh, it's really amazing to read about his life. Plutarch did a life of Alcibiades, which is a great reference piece. And there are two disputed dialogues about Alcibiades <clears throat> that don't appear in the Platonic canon, but that you can get online, most likely. I don't know if it's online or not, but they're available. And they're usually neglected or overlooked because um, they're not part of the accepted uh, platonic authorship. <clears throat> but they're interesting to read. He's a fabulous figure. Okay, we got that theme. Wait, so why does Alcibiades reject Socrates? You have to talk real loud. I'm going to have to get a hearing aid if I ever teach again. <laughs> why, does, why does Alcibiades reject Socrates? Yeah, that's a good question. Why would anybody reject the light? and reject the bearer of it, who is so clearly 
uh, savior figure? Why would you reject anybody that tries to teach you how to bring yourself into integration? I mean, that's the meaning of platonic justice. It's self-integration, justification. You know, that, that's one of the meanings. You, you justify something with the ruler and, and you bring lines into concordance. So was it just his own pride? Like, was it just yeah. that was why he's a personal pride? And why would anybody be... Um, you know, unsalvageable. What does it mean? That's, so that, that can take us to one of the aspects of the myth of Ur. Are, do people really decide about themselves before they're born? And therefore it's fated to be who you are? And okay, you get another chance at it a thousand years later. <laughs> but that chance, you know, is pretty much determined by what you were before. I mean, the myth of Ur is so, you know, delicate. The, the logic of the myth of Ur is very subtle about the relationship of freedom and destiny and fate and necessity. I mean, get that clear. Because they, if they get mixed up, you get confused. So freedom and destiny, you know, is, is, is the choice you have in the course of your life. And then fate and necessity Oh, it seems to overrule it in the ancient world. You're allowed some kind of measure of freedom and destiny, and it's not just illusion. <clears throat> you know, even in the Iliad, where fate and necessity is so strong, Achilles acts as though he has the chance to leave the fighting and go home. And he broods over that. He entertains that as a possible option. When you know, as he knows, that he's going to die at Troy. So it's a subtle intersect, almost at a point of no extension, to think about freedom and destiny and fate and necessity. And the myth of Ur tries to give expression to that by making it look like you've made the decision before you've been born, and you've got to live it out, even though at every moment of time you seemingly have the choice before you anyhow. That is, if you translate the myth of her into now, which I'm sure is what Plato had in mind. And we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later when we get to the myth of her. Yeah? So I'm a little confused. So when you, if it is that you have a fate. Yeah. Which is necessary. Which is, which is necessary. Yeah. Iron bound. Does that mean that all the actions that you think are free mm -hmm. are are done because they are necessary. Yeah. So what makes them necessary for you? Well, that's the dimension. See, you get, as long as you're caught in that dimension, that's what it is. And it's almost retrospective or retroactive. Mm -hmm. So once it's happened, it's obviously the case. So if you look at a person's life from its having been fulfilled or finished, mm -hmm. then everything looks like it's faded and necessary. Because that's the way it is. Yeah. Can't change anything. But while, well, you're living, right? while you're living, you still have this notion that freedom of destiny is operative and that in any moment you can make a free choice and decision. Even though when you look at it retrospectively or retroactively, it's faded. So you got to move, you got to be able to switch from one dimension to the other to... And you can only do that through death, pretty much. Pretty much. And that's why they make the myth of Ur, what happens to you after you die, to give expression to what you ought to take into account while you're alive. You've got to bring it to the now. That's why Socrates interrupts the myth with this little sermon about, are you listening? Yeah, this is happening now. So what you do is you tip the myth of her from its so-called post-mortal vector to its vertical vector. So it's not horizontal in the sense of life after death, which is nonsensical, there is no life after death. I don't know if any of you hold to that, but I certainly do. When you're dead, you're dead. So I you believe tip in consciousness, Paul, as long as you ask the question. That's Say the, what? I, I, like I believe, uh, Plato, believe in consciousness. Yeah. And I think I could find evidence in, in Plato. But do you think that, in that. the sense that that um, operates after death? The answer is yes. No, see, but I get away from it by making it vertical rather than horizontal. See, it doesn't make any sense to me that there's any time 
in a, a post-mortal sense, as an extension of conventional time. Conventional time ends at death, and there's no extension to it. So what do all these symbols then mean of so-called post-mortal post continuation and so on? Well, you render that vertical in order to bisect now. You, you stop the time flow from future to past, and you say, okay, now, what's at stake? What are the symbols that give expression to the meaning of life now? And so you translate those symbols into the vertical line, and you look at them vertically. And that, that to me makes sense, because they're, that's what I consider to be their meaning. They want to symbolically open up, through mythical means, the meaning of now. Now is... I, I love this phrase, you squeeze the universe into a ball and to roll it towards some overwhelming question. Mm -hmm. That's so beautiful. And that's what's being done in the myth of Earth. That's what Socrates wants to do with you. And that's why he breaks off his telling the myth to say, now, don't go into a trance, you know. I told you, I'm not telling you a myth or a legend or a story like Odysseus told to the Phaeacians about his trip to the underworld. I'm going to tell you a philosophical story that I got from Ur the Pamphylian, who was left for dead and brought the story back. It's a philosophical story, philosophical myth. And he breaks it off just like Odysseus does. Odysseus breaks off his telling his tale of the underworld to the Phaeacians, and as if to say, wants to wake them up. And Homer is really funny about that. They're all in a trance state. And Homer describes how it takes the Phaeacians a while to come back to themselves because they've been so transported by what Odysseus has told them. And so Socrates breaks his tale, and I'm led to believe to the very line, the numbered line, as Odysseus did. That's a little uncanny, as if to, as did Plato deliberately do that. And then he gives this little sermon about how what he's saying about what happens to you after you're dead is communicated to you living, and so you ought to get it now, because that's the stakes involved in living now. You're put before this existential decision about your life, and it's almost, I could say then, that in the now, you have the moment, the point of no extension, which is what a now is, because it's always past. The now is the point of no extension in which the intersection of fate, necessity, and freedom, and destiny occur. Okay, that's good. Let me stop for one second and congratulate myself on being able to say that. <laughs> because it's a real tough nut. But that's what Socrates is after. And it's, you know, I've had a hard time talking to you guys about what it means to become a person. That's what appears in the classic Greek context with Socrates. He's not only the guy who discovers the human soul, in some sense he's the paradigmatic person where the heights and depths and the, the, the forces of what it means to be human come t into expression. Yeah? Did you say that um, you know, the, the characters in uh, Homer's myths were ruled by fate, necessity, Mostly. and Socrates. Yeah. See, that's that. because subjectivity has come to the fore. Mm -hmm. They didn't have any in Homer. They're at the mercy of the play of forces. They don't have a standard self, mm -hmm. which is the soul, which Socrates represents. Now, I asked you guys if you had a soul, and you all said no, and I was real sorry about that. You know, so, you know, what the class is devoted to is to rediscovering something that's subsequently been lost. It's almost like you guys are, uh, you know, doing the Homeric reversal. <laughs> you know? And, uh, you know, and I could go through this whole thing of how modern science has brought this about by reducing life to matter. Why wouldn't the soul and spirit and the person and the moral self get evaporated accordingly? Yeah. Um, so, sort of what you're going back to with, with Myth of Ur, um, I was just writing some stuff down and I'm trying to make sense of it now. Sorry. Uh, so, 
what, what you were talking about is when, when he, he, he stops and he like tries to wake up the audience, right? Yeah. So what I, I was trying to think of what you were saying is that the myth of Ur is sort of inviting you to wake up from this trance. Right. And it invites you to have freedom, or freedom of thought. And freedom of choice about who you are. Yeah. And, and whether and you're going to be just and self-integrated or mm -hmm. self-destructive and disintegrated. Mm -hmm. That's the crossroads. And what I was, I was um, thinking is that it was, it was trying to make your... your uh, it's trying to make it so you're not trying to think of... You're not trying to figure out what your fate is. You're not trying to think about what fate is. You're trying to think about what destiny is. And with destiny, you have freedom of thought and freedom of choice. That's primary. But I think fate, that's obviously what he's trying to do. Yeah, but with fate, you have to, you have to, you have to rest on just... Um, of absolutes of thought. You could almost say that what happens to the most people is fate and necessity because they never take thought of it. Mm. And if you take thought of it, you at least have a chance to enter the dimension of freedom and destiny where you can decide about it. Mm. And that's the existential choice. Okay. And that's what happens now. Now let's pick it up from the beginning. Let's go from the opening of the Republic, which on rereading it and reading commentaries about it, it is so complicated. Man, I, I'm, I'm I could have gotten a headache, but I didn't. I mean, it, it, the, it's just a, such an amazing text. You know, I told some of the students before this we met today that I was the faculty advisor for Huey P. Newton, who was the leader of the Black Panther Party and for a while the leading civil rights figure in the country, the inheritor of the mantle of Malcolm X and Martin Luther King. He was very controversial because he was so militant. He picked up the gun as did all the Panthers, and they spooked everybody. But uh, I helped him get a BA here and a PhD, and when I read his biography, autobiography, revolutionary suicide, he thought he was already dead, so that's what made him so courageous and reckless. He says that when he went to prison, he was illiterate. He couldn't read. And what book did he pick up in order to teach himself how to read to overcome his involvement in oral street culture, but played as Republic. <laughs> I thought, whoa, of all the things that anybody would pick to learn how to read, I mean, here he rehearses the whole transition from oral to literate, which is what the Republic does, and that's the book Huey picked in order to become literate and rationally self-conscious, which he was in a great measure. Okay, so it's, it's a real complicated text. And, uh, you know, if we had a year, I, I would love to have a year with you guys where we could just concentrate on the Republic because it would open up Plato all together in the rest of the dialogues. Uh, you can actually kind of enter through the Republic because it is so central to the dialogue. And Socrates is so kind of the triumphant Socrates in all the early dialogues, he's the, the guy that drives people to an impasse, no exit. The Greek is aporia, A-P-O-R-I-A. And the conversation or the discussion uh, ends in a dead end. That's the early dialogues. And then the middle ones, of which the Republic is foremost, you have the expanse of Socrates and the discussion goes on in such an elaborate way. So it starts out with, I went down to the Piraeus, or we went down to the Piraeus, and it's the harbor of Athens, we mentioned this before, and the signal word is kateben, K-A-T-E-B-E-N, which means I, to descend, I went down. And it's the descent motif, as well as the ascent, coming back up again, that's critical to the Republic in the beginning, the middle, and the end. Because you have the parable of the cave, and the descent into the cave, and the effort to ascend out of the cave, and then the myth of Ur, which is another ascent into the underworld, and the ascent into you know, <coughs> the new life, the new birth. So there's all kinds of features in the opening lines we don't have to go through. I mean, they go to see this cult uh, of Bendis, who is a figure of the underworld, an underworld goddess, and that's just been brought into the Prius by Thracian sailors 
and they're having this celebration and so on. And it, the whole opening lines of the Republic are just so special. And then he meets uh, this old guy um, who talks to Odysseus, I mean, Socrates about how he's free of the ravages of youth and the impulses of desire and so on. Now he's an old man, he's kind of can relax and enjoy his last years. And it's a real tender and sentimental discussion that he carries on with Socrates. And he's a rich arms merchant, he made a lot of money uh, making arms. And there's this great line where he, where he can afford to enjoy his old age because the rich have many consolations. And uh, that encounter is um, a very dramatic one. Then you have, uh, you know, Thrasymachus, the big mouth brawler who just wants to argue that justice is the right of the mighty and what do you have to say about it? That's just the fact, period. Forget about any other talk about it's better to suffer injustice than to commit it. Yeah, right. It, you'll be easy to stamp on, stomp on. So, and you get to the myth of the cave, which is, again, extremely complicated in its symbolism and details. And it's obviously an indictment of television culture where you're chained to look at these shadows of images of reality and two removes at least and you don't know any better than that and i had to confess to students saturday that my wife and i watch you know anywhere from four to six hours of television every night so i got to confess that but you watch pbs paul well movies we mostly watch movies <laughs> Only once in a while. <laughs> it's always movies. So anyhow, that's the cave. You're just chained there, and you can't even turn your head. Your, your neck is chained to look to see wh wh where these images are coming from. And then somebody breaks free and goes into the light, you know, obviously Socrates, and comes down to tell the others that this ain't it. And he's finally so annoying that they kill him. So, it, you know, it's a very, it's, maybe I shouldn't say it's so complicated. It's, it's actually very, fairly simple compared to the myth of her, anyhow. And it's just taken on such, you know, I mean, that, the, the parable of the cave is one of the classic parables and texts of all time. I mean, that just, that, Plato sums something up there that uh, really hits home. Now, if you want to get into the philosophical conceptualizing of it, you can do the following. You guys um, grok the difference between essence and existence. Do you know that distinction? What something is essentially as opposed to what something is in its existence. You can almost say what something is potentially is something what it is essentially. And then it actualizes into existence. So that's a major Greek theme. And you got the kind of biggest pulse, push on it from Parmenides. He has to take a chariot ride above the realm of existence to the essential realm where he gets the vision of being. You say that being is the highest of all the essences. It's even almost beyond essences. And Plato calls it the good when you move from Parmenides to Plato. So it's, it, it's beyond essence. It's the essence of essences, if you can say that. And so essence, I, th I thought, how do you describe the difference between essence and existence? Essence is what is. Existence is that is. Quid est and quod est is a way of doing it in Latin, which is how they did do it, to, dis to describe the difference. So you have quiddity, quid as what is essentially the case, and quod est as that it is. So there's a, obviously a difference between 
what is essentially and what is existentially. You could say existence is what happens under the conditions of time and space. And essence is somehow beyond the conditions of time and space. It's this higher order act, this higher order realm that the Greeks of all people discover and compare and contrast with what is the case existentially, which is like a fall from the essential realm. The Greeks have a notion of the fall just like in the Judeo-Christian tradition. And that's one way to get a grasp on it. In the Bible, in the book of Genesis, uh, you have God creating human beings in his, in his own image. Men and women are created in the image of God, first account, and everything is perfect and good, and that's it. <clears throat> and God rests on the seventh day to celebrate the perfection of creation. Then it's told over again. From the point of view of the fall, you could almost say from the point of view of existence. First account, human beings are essentially good and perfect. No problem. Second account, eh, doesn't look that way. You've got, how are you going to account for the existential fall? Which is apparent to everybody. And even the fall into history. From this prior perfect realm, which is heavenly and so on. How do you get into history? How do you get into existence? That's the purpose of the second account. So human beings are, Adam is created from the dust of the ground to juxtapose against the image of God, imago dei. So you have the image of God versus dust of the ground, perfect way to juxtapose the essence and existence. And then you have the prohibition not to eat of the tree, of the knowledge that everything is possible, or the knowledge of good and evil. I like the knowledge of everything is possible because when you eat of it, you get vertigo. The vertigo of possibilities. And that leads to the fall and the expulsion from the garden and the curse. So that's the difference in the biblical account of essence and existence. In the Greeks, they had something comparable in the sense of falling from the realm, the celestial realm. We were all once stars. And the stars were... Um, fragmented and all this stardust fell to earth and we're composed of this stardust and we long to return to our celestial <laughs> origins. Not bad, huh? Fascinating now, insight. Isn't Definitely. that incredible? Yes. Kept tell them, Terry. I mean, mm -hmm. physics today tells you that we are composed of stardust. Yeah. And this is actually said in Plato and I learned it there and then one day you know, long after that, I read, hey, it's in fact. The fact is we were composed of stardust. So that's amazing. But this is basically a Gnostic myth or an Orphic myth after the Orpheus figure. And it became a kind of religion in Greece. And the myth of the fall is central to it. And they do it on a pun. Soma, Sima. Soma, body, sema, prison. So our souls, as it were, have fallen into our body prison and upon death we're released. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm curious. I don't know if you're going to not like me saying this, but do you think that if we could have this fall from this existential fall take place from the realm of our essential being from from so we have the essential being being and then the thing that exists yeah okay um do you think that if that fall could happen in science <laughs> that that would that would conquer or, or that would get like all your beef with with science yeah really. would go out the window clarify what you mean by fall from yeah science. fall from I mean, what where did it so fall from? from, that from so you're falling from so what we think is we, right now we think the essence of the universe is atoms in science. Yeah. Right? Right. So if we realize that the essence of the universe, you know, atoms is, is part of, of what the universe is, but it's not what the universe it's not the existence of the universe. We really can't know that. What we can try to do is still keep like looking what the existence is, but we can't really find out what the existence is. Yeah, I don't. Why can't we? 
Why can't we? Something you can't put under a microscope. Yeah. So what happened? Well, I mean, <clears throat> what what would be the existence of the universe? You can always look smaller. Energy explains it. Energy and atom, okay, atomic, well, atomic, all of the observable universe. And yeah. Okay. So then you have so you have. So, the non-observable universe, what is that? That's still something that exists. Listen, that? To, listen to this. I yeah. mean, this will give you what I think. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a response to what you've asked in the sense of what science has done. And we can say, uh, you know, you have, I told you, you have an ontology of life in the ancient world and an ontology of death in the modern world, thanks mm -hmm. to science. And... Um, you could say it's a fall from the kind of full expression of life into uh, the reduction of life to matter. An ancient ontology of life and a modern ontology of death. From the physical sciences, they're spread over the conception of all existence. An ontology whose model entity is pure matter, stripped of all features of life. What at the animistic stage was not even discovered has in the meantime conquered the vision of reality entirely ousting its counterpart. The tremendously enlarged universe of modern cosmology is conceived as a field of inanimate masses and forces which operate according to the laws of inertia and of quantitative distribution in space. This denuded substratum of all reality could only be arrived at through a progressive expurgation of vital features from the physical record and through the strict abstention from projecting into its image our own felt aliveness. In the process, the ban on anthropomorphism, namely the projecting of our own experience of life into all that, was extended to zoomorphism in general. So you couldn't even extend animal and vegetable, but it's here, especially animal life, into what is. What remained is the residue of the reduction toward the properties of mere extension, which submit to measurement and hence to mathematics. These properties alone satisfy the requirements of, of what is now called exact knowledge. So you not only lop off the whole wisdom tradition, you lop off all the salient features of life to get down to what I would call dead matter. And that's the going paradigm of modern science. And I told you that this guy that I recently found, Atlan, famous French scientist, says the life sciences should be called the death sciences. I mean, he nails it. And then he quotes these two guys, Zen Georgie and another guy, saying that life is not a possible object of scientific exploration. They concede that. So, and here's the next one. <clears throat> this is right off of Galileo, where the turning point occurs. The natural world was portrayed as a vast, self-contained mathematical machine consisting of motions of matter in space and time. And man with his purposes, feelings, and secondary qualities was shoved apart as an unimportant spectator and semi-real effect of the great mathematical drama outside. The features of the world now classed as secondary, unreal, ignoble, and regarded as dependent on the deceitfulness of sense are just those features which are most intense to man in all but his purely theoretic activity, and even in that, except where he confines himself strictly to the mathematical method. It was inevitable that in these circumstances man should now appear to be outside of the real world. Man is hardly more than a bundle of secondary qualities. Observe that the stage is set for the Cartesian dualism on the one side of primary, the mathematical realm, on the other, the realm of man. And the premium of importance and value as well as of independent existence all goes with the former. Man begins to appear for the first time in the history of thought as an irrelevant spectator, an insignificant effect 
of the great mathematical system, which is the substance of reality. How do you like that? Logical positivism. Can I, yeah. Can I say, so uh, the quote you just said about um, life cannot, can you repeat that? Life cannot be the, the subject of scientific inquiry. Yeah, possible uh, object of scientific inquiry. Because okay. it, it's been stripped of all of its features. Can so. I say, I completely disagree with that. Okay. And Good. the reason why <laughs> is because I think, I think he... The negative judgment and the ding on zik. And every single thinker was powerful as Napoleon and crafty as Metternich. And it really was very attractive to be able to talk about tables and to ask what the table is, and to draw the cork out of an old conundrum and watch the paradoxes fizz. And it made one confident to think that nothing really was what it seemed under the sun, that the actual was not real and the real was not with us, and all that mattered was the one. And they said, the man in the street is so naive he never can see the wood for the trees. He thinks he knows he sees the thing, but cannot tell you how he knows the thing he thinks he sees. And oh, how much I like the concrete universal. I never thought I should be telling them vice versa, that they can't see the trees for the wood. But certainly it was fun while it lasted, and I got my honors degree and was stamped as a person of intelligence and culture. Forever, wherever two or three persons of intelligence and culture are gathered together and talk, writing definitions on invisible blackboards with non-existent chalk. But such sacramental occasions are nowadays comparatively rare. There is always a wife or a boss or a dun or a client disturbing the air. Barbarians always, life in the particular always, dozens of men in the street, and the perennial, if unimportant, problem of getting enough to eat. So blow the bugles over the metaphysicians, let the pure mind return to the pure mind. I must be content to remain in the world of appearance and sit on the mere appearance of a behind. But in case you should think my education was wasted, I hasten to explain that having once been to the University of Oxford, you can never really again believe anything that anyone says. And that, of course, is an asset in a world like ours. Why bother to water a garden that is planted with paper flowers? Oh, the freedom of the press, the late night final tomorrow's pulp. One should not gulp one's port, but as it isn't port, I'll gulp if I want to gulp. Mm -hmm. But probably I'll just enjoy the color and pour it down the sink for I don't call advertisement a statement or any quack medicine a drink. Goodbye now, Plato and Hegel. The shop is closing down. They don't want any philosopher kings in England. There ain't no universals in this man's town. Bravo. <laughs> See, there you have it when, when you, you get this funny resentment over having once seen the light, you know, he mentions the word communion, you know, and you know, in a way, what a teacher tries to do is commune with his students, and that's the kind of uh, relationship you come into with Socrates. Plato wants you to commune with him, and there is an experience of communion if you really get it. You know that he he's so brilliant in the dialogues in making Socrates live in these conversations that take place, and that you participate in with them that it's a kind of communion. And uh, I, I, I wish I could express to you exactly what I mean by that, because in a way it's, it's related to the immortality of the soul, it's related to the myth of her, that every time we gather like this to discuss that, it happens. And I have this Penny University where Terry and Mary come every Monday and it's been going on since 1974. Other colleagues, other colleagues as well. And Rail <laughs> is another stalwart member of the Penny University. And uh, Paige and I started it in 1974, and it's still going on every Monday. And I, there's a moment in the Platonic Dialogues where Plato says something about how what they're conversing about, referring to Socrates doing the conversing, here and now is eternally 
renewable. There's the notion of the eternal return. Every time you come back again to talk about it, it's happening again, as if it's never stopped. And I wish I could read that passage to you because it conveys what I'm only in a clumsy way trying to remember. As if the eternal now takes place when you get it in reading the dialogue and he makes present to you what is so far past. And I get that sense every once in a while at the Penn University because we've been doing it since 1974 and after you build up a certain accumulative, it's kind of almost like the reverse of the mass of perdition. You get this massive communion that we experience with one another every Monday for an hour and 15 minutes and have been doing it for that long a time. Paul, I regard it as therapy for smart thinking people who <laughs> have to encounter what our civilization is. Becoming. Yeah, no kidding. And it is therapeutic for a lot of us, even though we go over the same stuff again and again and again. It's the fact that we're doing it together. And so I want to give this kind of theme of communion to you that you can do it on your own by retrieving any of this material because the spiritual transmission is waiting there to occur. And I think you can make that intact for yourself and overcome all the differences in time and circumstance and whatever. And it comes through to you. And that's miraculous. And that's the legacy of the Greeks to us. I'm convinced of it. So thank you for this opportunity to have gone through this episode, this experience again and to uh, enjoy uh, this time we've had together and the material that we've had a chance to go over. Hasta la vista. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh boy. So did you get the time? Did you get the aroma? Yes. <laughs> Don't forget. Thymus vulgaris, thymus well, gland, centered self, soul, the seat of your person, the center of your moral decision making. Please awaken that in yourself. And don't let this middle <coughs> realm be empty and vacuous. That's the message I want to leave. And that comes straight from Plato. So now what? Now we go home. Like Socrates said, the myth was saved. And it'll save us if we believe it. And then, you know, in the Phaedo, when he says goodbye, you know, I, I die, I go to die, and you guys go to live. And the odd thing, tell me what you think of this. He asks for one of the persons around him to sacrifice a cock to Asclepius. Actually, his last words. What's he mean? Why should he? Why should there be a cock sacrificed to Asclepius? You know who Asclepius is? A Greek god of healing. And there were many temples devoted to Asclepius. You went there to be healed, and you often slept overnight. Um, it was a practice. Incubation. They, they called it technically incubation. You slept overnight and over. While you were asleep, you got an omen from the god. The god would appear to you. Asclepius would appear and, and, in a way, diagnose your illness and whether you're going to get well or not. And yet there is snakes sacred to Asclepius that would slither out and you know, bite you or whatever because snake venom was considered medicinal if you only got a little dose. And that's why the snakes are entwined on the staff of Asclepius, the emblem of doctors. So why was Socrates interested in having a cock sacrificed to Asclepius? Because he was going to be cured through death of the disease of life, trapped in the prison. Nietzsche has a fit with that. I mean, he thinks that's so objectionable, you know that life was thought to have been a disease that you had to be cured from, and that Socrates is now going to be healed through death. So, you tell me. Oh, and I want to get, uh, yeah, here's the last line. This is so amazing to learn. 
talk about how one's life is decided upon before one's born. They practiced a ceremony in Athens. It was a festival. It was called the Sixth Day of Thargalion in the Greek calendar. It must have been a month of Thargalion. And then on the sixth day, they took a convict, usually a criminal, that they saved out for the purpose and whom they had kind of fattened up with figs and barley cakes and so on. And they led him to the outmost precincts of the city, way beyond. And the whole purpose was to rid the city of pollution. It was a scapegoat festival. And there they beat the figure on his genitals with leeks and then murdered him and burned him and that this was a sacrificial act that purified the city. And it was called the Festival of the Scapegoat, the Greek word for which is pharmakon, hmm. which in, 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 uh, remarkably is also the word for drug, charm, recipe, and scapegoat. You know, it's the word for pharmacy, uh, pharmacopoeia, pharmacist, drug. And there's this notion of the wounded healer that goes to the snakes. You know, poisons and proper doses are medicines. And so you take that to the wounded healer, like the crucifixion of Jesus. And here, on the sixth day of Thargalion, they practice this scapegoat ritual and festival, rather like the mocking and crucifixion of Jesus. They have really great parallels. And there's even a, a phrase in the Greek thing that talks about how the scapegoat will be the ugliest of them all, which is the prophecy of Isaiah about the Messiah. And so, based on the scapegoat festival, the sixth day of Thargalion, you have to be informed that Socrates was born on that day. and he becomes the scapegoat of Athens. Okay. Thank you again. Thank you. Don't applaud so many. <laughs>